This is the Paul McGuire Report. On today's program, we're going to give you an expose based on facts about certain individuals and certain things that are happening in America um, that I don't think many of our listeners are aware of. Some of you are aware of it. And I've been writing and researching about these things for decades, so it's not something that's new to me. In fact, my research and experiences go back, oh, back to the the, the 1970s. What I'm talking about is going to be difficult for some people to process. There are certain people who, because the... uh, nature of this topic, which is fact-based, by the way, and it is documented, unless I say otherwise, in the context of the program, I'll say it's not documented, I'll say it's a speculation. But if it's documented, I I will reference it as documented. What is going on, really, is something very dark, very sinister, but very real. But the problem is that the subject matter I'm about to get into is so intense, it's so mind-boggling for the average person, it's so mentally overwhelming that many people can't handle it. And so the mind works according to laws and principles and physiology and biology and various things. And there's a there's a principle about how the human mind works that scientists and psychologists uh, have discovered a long time ago. And it's this. And before we delve into the topic, I want to lay out the principle for you. Because once you understand this principle, you will understand why people reject truth why people turn off their brains when they're confronted with facts in very, very large numbers. One of the primary principles of the human mind or the human brain is this. The human mind or the human brain constantly seeks equilibrium. The human mind and human brain seeks equilibrium. its own comfort zone. Now, this is a very, very important principle to grasp because unless you grasp this principle, we can't really move forward. So, on a psychological level, a biochemical level, a physiological level, and on a multiplicity of levels, the human mind, body, soul, spirit operates on this principle. The human mind, the human brain, will always seek out situations, people, environments, culture, beliefs, experiences that it is comfortable with, that it knows, that is kind of like the human brain and human mind will will inevitably seek out for lack of better words, home. Home. Now, what does home represent? Home represents the environment that you grew up in as a young, young, young child. Now, psychologists and neuroscientists don't know when this bonding occurs between the human mind and its environment. My supposition is that it begins in the womb, and I'll tell you why. First of all, this whole idea that a baby in the womb is not a baby, but but uh, a, a less than human being that they've arbitrarily called a fetus is absolute, irrational, illogical, non-scientific nonsense. It is stupidity personified. Let me illustrate it, okay? Let's say you or anyone else you know are at a party, 
and, and you stand up and you're playing some kind of party game, okay? And everybody knows what you look like. They know what your face looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you put a large uh, uh, paper grocery shopping bag over your head, all right? And you walk around the room. Now, everybody in that room, unless they're clinically insane or intoxicated, knows that just because you put a shopping a paper shopping bag over your head, they know it's still you underneath the shopping bag. Period. End of story. No debate. No questions. <clears throat> because it's just common sense. So when you choose to take that paper shopping bag off your head in this lay, this uh, party game we're imagining, they'll see the real you. But they know when you put the shopping bag on, they're still looking at the real you. There's just this flimsy, thin, little paper uh, shopping bag covering you. But it's still you. It's obvious. I mean, this is so, such a no-brainer, it's not even worth discussing, except we're dealing with people who, 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 who choose with their wills to reject logic and truth. Okay, so now with a baby, okay? And this would go back really to conception in the womb. But just for the sake of argument, let's say a baby is uh, four or five months uh, old inside the womb, all right? So from the time of conception, the baby in the womb that the mother is carrying is, let's say, She's been pregnant for four months or five months. Now, to call that baby a fetus is absurd. You can photograph it, photograph it with a number of electronic instruments that are very precise, like ultrasound and even newer technologies. Um, when my wife was pregnant <clears throat> with all of our children, I looked at the ultrasound along with my wife when, when our babies were like, I mean, they, they, I guess they were a month old, if that. And we could tell. The nurse pointed it out, and we had twins. She, my wife was carrying twins, and you could see the two little babies, okay, in, in my uh, wife's womb. And then when she was about pregnant with our son, you could see uh, our little baby son, you know, about a month old, in my wife's womb, with great clarity. And the clarity was so clear that you, she showed us you could actually identify uh, the sex of all of the babies at, at, at a very, very, I mean, not long after birth. And I don't, I don't want to quote the exact amount of weeks, okay? Because I can't, really can't remember the exact amount of weeks. But the, the baby <clears throat> doesn't, the woman doesn't really have to be pregnant all that long. The, the photography is so clear that you can see or identify what sex the baby is. Now, that's clearly a baby. To call it a fetus is an act of insanity. Okay, now to prove it's not a fetus... You can, or a doctor can, um, stimulate or through surgery or whatever, depending on various situations, you can uh, bring a baby out of the mother's womb early, or what they call prematurely, prematurely by a couple of months, and I don't know what the cutoff date is, I think it differs, okay? So, so relatively long before the baby is ready to be born, which means the baby exits the womb of the mother and enters the world, okay, um, it's clear that that baby is not a fetus. It's a baby. And all you have to do is... Uh, allow a doctor to stimulate a birth prematurely or remove the baby prematurely from the womb through some kind of surgery, and that baby uh, will be um, premature and might require some extra medical attention, but 
the mother will be able to hold a fully formed human baby with fingers, eyes, toes, total human lifelike form, like a little, little doll, human baby doll, okay? It's a baby, man. You have to be really somebody would have had to drop your head repeatedly on a cement floor for you not to be able to intellectually process the obvious fact that there's no such thing as a fetus that's a that's a uh, that's a fictional word no there's no such thing as a fetus it's a baby it's a human being so when the baby's born either early or whatever, it's obvious. There's not some magical pixie dust that comes into the room and magically or supernaturally transforms that fetus into a human baby. It was always a human baby. So when the baby is still in the womb, that baby can sense all kinds of information. And that's my point here. The baby can sense all kinds of information. The baby can hear stuff. The baby can feel stuff. The baby can has an intuition. The baby can experience a vast spectrum of information and stimuli. Let me give you examples. The baby can hear the music, the kind of music that is being played uh, around the baby, um, the baby's in the womb, but outside of the womb, the mother is in some kind of environment like a room, the, the baby can hear the music. The baby can hear classical music, Christian worship mu- music, um, hip-hop, rap, rock and roll, country, whatever. That's why it's so vitally important that you make sure that you're not selfish as a, a mother, and that when you're in driving in the car or whatever, you're not just thinking of yourself and smoking a cigarette and, you know, turning up the, the, the stereo full blast in your car and playing, you know, uh, death metal, rock and roll, or really dark hip-hop or rap or... Uh, um, any music that is spiritually dark um, and and that has rhythms and beats and notes that are what what are, what are called bombastic, you know, rock and roll. Whether it's way back to Elvis Presley, um, whether it's you know contemporary rock and roll, whether it's hip hop, whether it's rap many forms of country, uh, can be very intense and dark. And not only that, the baby can hear and understand the lyrics and the songs and the messages in the music. Now you say, well, the baby doesn't understand English. That's true. The baby doesn't understand English, but the baby, or whatever language the music's in, but the baby is big. the minute the baby can hear music with lyrics and songs in whatever language it's spoken in, that baby has begun the learning process of interpretation of what those words and songs mean. Now, the baby may not be able to have the consciousness to understand what, what the communication is in the song while the baby is still in the womb. But remember, the subconscious mind which the baby has, the conscious mind of the baby in the womb may not remember all the lyrics and songs that were played to it, or not played to it, but that, that they heard inside the womb. But in the baby's subconscious mind, the baby is storing everything because the subconscious mind is like a super memory and even though the baby consciously may not be able to remember all that exterior input subconsciously the the baby is filing it away filing it away and so when the baby comes of age to understand let's say english or whatever language 
the baby, even if the baby doesn't do this consciously, the baby has the neurological ability to subconsciously learn a language, retrieve all these songs that it heard inside the womb. The baby also can hear the conversations, voices, speaking that are, that are happening outside of the womb the conversations between the mother and the father of the baby, or the conversations of just a single mother, whether it's arguing and fighting and screaming and cursing, the baby can, the baby even in the womb, <clears throat> may not be able to linguistically understand all of the words, but the baby can interpret the emotion the baby can sense inside the womb when the parents are talking or fighting or joy or whatever the human beings are doing around the baby uh, outside of the womb. The baby has a, a very intelligent brain and the baby knows and can sense anger, hatred, bitterness, uh, cruelty, Pain, sorrow, fear. Yes, the baby can sense fear in the human voice. Panic. Those are just some of the emotions. But the baby can also sense in both the music, the lyrics, the songs, and the conversations and voices that are going on all outside of the mother's womb. The baby can also sense deeply deeply, um, joy, love, peace, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God, um, tranquility, and a very large range of positive emotions and positive words. The baby can experience that, and the baby knows what it means, and the baby understands that. So the baby understands the negative and the darkness from songs, lyrics, music, spoken words, and the baby understands the full range of positive things. Now, one of the things my wife and I did, we did a lot of things uh, that the Holy Spirit led us to do. I'm a thinking person uh, because I chose to be, and anybody listening to me, you know, people sometimes think, you may think that you're not a thinking person, but I want to lovingly suggest to you that what you think about yourself in, in many cases is not always true. So many of you may think, because you've been programmed to think this way, you think that you're not a thinking person. And I'm here to suggest to you that that's completely false. Because every single person that God creates is a thinking person. So if you think either consciously or subconsciously that you're not a thinking person, or that you're not intelligent or whatever, I want to lovingly exhort you and correct you and say that's a lie. You're believing a lie, and when you believe a lie and not the truth, you're in prison, you're confined, and God came, Jesus came, to set the captives free. The truth is, you are a thinking person, and you began thinking when you were in the womb, okay? And you need to, you need to understand how important a deep ownership of that truth is. You need to allow the Holy Spirit of God to give you a revelation of what that means because when you have a revelation of what that means, it will radically transform your life and you will then be released to become all that God created you to be, which is far, far, far bigger and more than you may think it is. Because again, your thought about yourself, your thought about your destiny you're thinking about your future and your life and your purpose, all of those thoughts may be false and based on lies. 
They may contain severe limitations, shut doors, impossibilities, which you think are factual and true, and then you plan and act on your life accordingly. But I'm here to, again, challenge you and tell you that um, those thoughts that you have about yourself and your life and your abilities and stuff, and when you think about yourself and they're confining, limiting, door-shutting, impossibility uh, perceptions, etc., I'm here to tell you that that is all a lie. What you think about yourself defines you. And if you're thinking wrong thoughts about yourself, because you were programmed to, um, you need to, see, we could use a religious word like repent, but really what we're saying, a more accurate contemporary would be, it's, it's to have, not, not repent. It's not that repent doesn't communicate the message. It does. It's just an archaic term. Therefore, it has a, its impact is lessened. A better word would be, you need to have a radical change, and you need to change and participate in a radical transformation and a total change in your thinking about who you are and your life and your destiny and future. Because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, as a man or a woman thinketh, so is he or so is she. And I want to say that again. In the book of Proverbs, it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Or we could say, as a man or a woman thinketh, so is he or so is she. Now, this is far, far beyond humanistic positive thinking. This gets into syncing your mind, your consciousness up with God and lining your mind and consciousness and thoughts up with what the Word of God says. And remember, God is a creator, capital C, and you are his creation. And so he, wanted, he wants to teach you to think properly about yourself, and that will revolutionize and release your life. Okay, so this begins in the womb. The, the unborn child in the womb can feel and sense all these emotions. So if that unborn child in the womb is in an environment where dark music is always being played, screaming and yelling and fighting, uh, uh, feeling the emotions of hatred and anger, resentment, uh, violence, uh, fear, paranoia, whatever, if, if that baby's consciousness and mind is being saturated with that intense negativity, which that baby can pick up not only through its hearing sense, the baby can pick it up because the baby experiences with the mother all the biochemicals that the mother is producing. So if the mother, with her thinking and her words, or just her private thinking, is producing uh, brain biochemistry of adrenaline, fear, paranoia, negativity, depression, anxiety, anger, uh, uh, rage or suppressed rage, and all these other emotions, that baby is simultaneously experiencing those same emotions because the baby is receiving those biochemicals from the mother into the baby's brain and being, okay? So that's very important that we always remember that the baby in the womb needs to be nurtured. So what my wife and I did is we would constantly play the Word of God on audio tapes. Back then, people used audio tapes today, but you, you would use a different technology. But we would pr play, uh, play the pure Word of God over and over and over again, knowing that all of our babies were hearing the Word of God over and over and over again while they were still in the womb. We would play Christian worship music over and over again when they were in the womb. 
we would speak life and blessing to them while they were in the womb. We would, we would make a habit of when we were talking, um, when my wife was, you know, expectant with a child, we would make an effort to make sure our language and communication was bathed with love and hope and peace, etc. And then we, we guarded, uh, uh, we didn't allow, like, we would watch news programs and stuff like that, but we wouldn't just carelessly allow our babies, uh, even when they were in my wife's womb, to hear the garbage from the television set, whether it was so-called entertainment or news, because that's like a poison box, and that baby is vicariously receiving like a poison, all right? And then we would um, also, um, while all of the, both of us volunteered before my wife got pregnant, both of us volunteered to work in the nursery. That was me, too. I, I did and she did for young infants. Um, and um, that, that was important because we both learned a lot. We both came from dysfunctional homes, so we both learned a lot. So when our kids were got of a certain age, though, we took them actually... When, when our kids were very, very young, right after they were born, we made a habit of uh, walking into the sanctuary during the time of worship and during the preaching and to sit quietly um, um, and we would do this when my wife had not given birth yet because we wanted to expose the babies in my wife's womb to the powerful worship and the presence of God in the sanctuary and the preaching of God's word. We wanted the babies to hear that and experience that while they were in the womb. So we made a choice that was uh, not necessarily popular and... Um, it was the opposite of what the majority of parents were doing. And let me add this, okay? If our babies, uh, once the babies were born, we continued the habit. We didn't want them stuck in a nursery, okay? No, no. We wanted our baby. The power of the Holy Spirit, because this was church on the way during its... Uh, and when it was in its days of powerful revival, and Jack Hayford, one of my, my spiritual fathers and mentors, uh, Church in the Way was experiencing uh, a decade or more of a powerful revival. So the presence of the Holy Spirit was constantly, you could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in that sanctuary. Now don't think for a moment, that babies that are highly spiritually sensitive, they can, they can sense and experience the presence of the Holy Spirit or the absence of the Holy Spirit. So what my wife and I would do is I would accompany my wife and she would have one or two of the babies because remember, they were twins or we would rotate them. We would sit in our seats quietly, but we wanted our baby babies to hear the singing of the people, including us, as we worship the Lord, we wanted the, our babies to physically hear singing uh, by a congregation that was anointed by the Holy Spirit. So we wanted our babies to, to experience and hear from their earliest days after birth the, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the voices um, of adults singing and, and, and the godly lyrics. We, you see, we believe that it was, we prioritized and we believed it was absolutely essential for our babies not to be stuck in a nursery somewhere, but for our babies to be bathed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to drink in the presence of the Holy Spirit, to experience the uh, Holy Spirit and to experience 
the anointing uh, uh, and preaching of God's holy word. We wanted to expose our children to that because that it was powerful because we knew that and, and we made sure that was done before they were born and then after they were born. And we determined that was probably one of the most important things we could do for them. So what happened was, because some of you may be wondering this, if our babies began to disrupt in any way, crying, fidgeting, you know, uh, even even the, the slightest hint that they were going to disrupt the service, we would sit towards the back at the end of the aisle and we would very quietly and immediately and inconspicuously, so we wouldn't interrupt anybody, we would walk out the door. And so that baby, we would not allow the babies um, that my wife was, you know, holding closely to her to disrupt the service or distract attention from the preaching in any way, shape, or form. Those babies were out of that sanctuary in a heartbeat, and they, then they would go to the nursery or whatever, because, because it is highly rude and disrespectful um, to bring a young baby and allow that baby to cry and disrupt a service, because then the adults and the people who have come to hear God's word and to be ministered to are unable to be ministered to because there's a very annoying distraction and that's selfishness. So I want to emphasize that we did this, but we did this with a hard rule, which we abided by. If there was any signal of any disruptive uh, behavior in our babies that would distract uh, the people who came to worship God, we quietly and without notice would leave immediately, and then we would uh, either stand outside till they fell asleep or whatever. Okay, I want to make that very, very clear. But now, we were looked on as, as being so, somewhat odd for this decision. But you see, I know it was the right decision, because the baby's capacity before the baby is born, and newborn babies, their capacity to remember Everything that happened in the womb and everything that happened from the earliest ages of birth stays with them forever. They may not remember it in their conscious mind. In fact, most of the time, they won't remember it in their conscious mind. But in their subconscious mind and in their spirit, they will remember the Spirit of God coming close to them, the presence of the Holy Spirit ministering to them. You see, what that does is that introduces your child to the Lord in a very powerful way. And it prepares them to be born again because that becomes their home. And they will automatically, the Bible says, train up a child or raise up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. The idea is that you raise your child up in the Lord and they won't depart with it, uh, to depart from the Lord when they're older, even though they may have a season of rebellion, which could last 10 or 20 years, by the way. Eventually, they'll come back. Okay, so the, 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 what I'm trying to lay the foundation here is that the brain remembers everything, okay? The subconscious remembers everything. And if you want to be... If you want to be, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you my wife and I were perfect parents because that would be a flat out lie. All of us are imperfect parents. All of us look back and we, 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 we deeply regret mistakes we made, errors in judgment. Every single one of us is parents. So I don't want to create a lying illusion to you that Paul McGuire and his wife, Christina McGuire, were the ideal parents. That's total nonsense. We were and are imperfect parents just like you. And it's only the grace of God um, that we were able to be uh, parents. But, but, but we don't measure the success of our parenthood, by the way. And I, I want to say this because I, I really believe the Holy Spirit has prompted me to say this. 
because the Holy Spirit wants to set a lot of you who are listening to the Paul McGuire Report right now at this moment. I believe the Holy Spirit uh, wants to set a lot of you free at this very moment. I see, I believe this is a, a principle that I've operated on from the first time uh, I did my first show as a radio talk show host. The rule I had was this. Um, the, the, the covenant with God I, I made was this. Lord, <clears throat> when you show up or the Holy Spirit shows up in, in the studio um, when I'm doing a program, then, Lord, I give over my agenda, my uh, show topics. You, Lord, are Lord. And when you show up, when I'm doing a radio program, my job is to immediately get out of the way and let you be Lord. Not that, that he needs me to let him, but to get out of the way. I can't tell you how many people uh, uh, don't make room for God in presentations. Well, the Lord has showed up, and, and I'm not saying that in an exaggerated sense. So I need to get out of the way, and I need to do what God wants me to do. That's how oh, the door is open for ministry. And the Lord prompted me to say this to many of you. And when I say it, it's going to set you free from, from what feels like hundreds and hundreds of pounds of guilt regarding your children. And what I want to say to you is this. Your child may be an adult, a young adult, teenager, whatever age your child is, or an older adult, um, and your child of whatever age may be in rebellion from God, say they hate God, living a lifestyle which is completely opposite from what God's word teaches, may say they hate Christianity. They may even be worshiping a false god or involved in some kind of occult stuff or all kinds of stuff. Okay? I want to tell you something right now, and I really believe God is prompting me to tell you this. You are not to beat yourself up over and over and over again and continually blame yourself and, and say that the rebellion uh, of your child of whatever age was caused by you, your mistakes, your hypocrisy, or whatever, or your failure. Okay? This is very important. Satan's primary strategy in spiritual warfare against all believers is revealed in Revelation 12, where we read that Satan is the accuser of the brethren who goes before the throne room of God day and night, making accusations about us before the Lord. And then in the verses after that, it says, But they, we believers, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, that means our sins are forgiven, and the word of our testimony, which means we've been forgiven and saved by Jesus Christ. So we defeat the accuser because there's a demonic root in this self-accusation. We defeat the accuser by receiving by faith the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us of all sin, and by faith we receive the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All of us, including myself, are sinners saved by grace. As such, we may have had the loftiest of, of goals as parents. All of us have failed as parents. I have never met a perfect parent in my life. And we all fail maybe in different ways. We did something right here and something wrong there. And we are all imperfect people. And nobody knows that better than our children, who are quick to point out our shortcomings and faults because they know us. The Lord wants to set you free right now from all this self-condemnation, all this guilt, and, and the, the way I would describe it is that you're constantly beating yourself up, you're constantly blaming yourself, you're constantly torturing yourself for your child's rebellion or distance from the Lord because you think 
you caused it by your hypocrisy, your sins, your failure, your mistakes. Now, let's let the light of the Lord shine on it. First of all, every single Christian parent has made mistakes and failures, okay, and sins. Every single one of us, maybe in different areas or whatever. We've all been guilty of hypocrisy. None of us did everything right. But your child's rebellion from the Lord, or your child, even though your child will tell you it's your fault, um, your child's rebellion from the Lord, or our hard heartedness from God, or walking away from Christianity, the Lord wants to tell you. In fact, the Lord wants to speak to you by name right now. He's calling your name and telling you that he wants you, and he's speaking to you by name, he wants you to stop believing the lie that is being generated by the accuser of the brethren. The Lord knows you're imperfect, as we all are. We're all sinners saved by grace. That's why we were in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved us, salvation. Okay? You have, I'm sure already, Ask the Lord for forgiveness of everything that you've done wrong. <clears throat> as a parent and as a human being, you've probably asked for forgiveness in prayer countless numbers of times. The Lord, I believe, is interrupting this show to speak to you directly by name and say, I have heard all of your prayers where you ask me for forgiveness, ask me to cleanse you with the blood of Jesus Christ, concerning your failures uh, as a person in life, your sin in life, your sin as a parent, your sin as a, a husband or a wife, your sins, your mistakes, your errors in judgment, your flesh. The Lord is saying to you, I have heard those prayers of repentance. And the Lord said, I answered those prayers. I have cleansed you with the blood of Jesus Christ which you've asked for. And so you have already been cleansed of all the sins you committed as a parent and a person in life. In addition to that, by faith, when I see you, I don't remember all those sins because they're forgiven. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ. You've totally been cleansed from them. And Jesus Christ took the penalty for those sins on the cross. And then the Lord would say to you that, I don't remember the sins. When I see you, I see you, and he's calling you by name, I see you as totally holy and righteous by faith. By faith, you've received the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so what does this mean? The Lord wants to change your identity. He wants you to see yourself <clears throat> as a completely forgiven person saved by grace who did the best that they could and everything else has already been forgiven by God. So if God himself has forgiven you for all your failings and sins as a parent, etc., then it's your job to see yourself and get in agreement with how God sees you and how God classifies you. That means you must immediately stop beating yourself up blaming yourself, rehearsing all your mistakes, saying it's your fault. It may be very true that you did really bad things that that were bad, that really uh, messed up your child. You may have done some really bad stuff. But guess what? If you've presented that to the Lord, all that stuff has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He doesn't see it anymore. Okay, you are forgiven. You are released, and, and the Lord wants you to allow the Holy Spirit to give you a revelation of that in your heart so that you can be released from those hundreds of pounds of guilt you've been carrying, which are just, it's just tearing down your health. It's making you depressed. And the Lord says you're released. You are released and forgiven of all your failure. And then the Lord wants you to know that in reality, your mistakes, sins, and failures may have, in part, contributed 
to negative things that happen in your child's life. That may be a reality, but the Lord is saying, I've forgiven you of all that. Okay, I've cleansed you by my blood by all that. And every Christian parent has made mistakes. Okay, now the Lord is also wants you to know that he has heard your prayers and answered them. And the Lord has heard every prayer that you have prayed for your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters who have rebelled, who have walked away from the Lord, who are living sinful lifestyles. The Lord is saying to you by name. Yeah, he's calling you by name right now. You can feel the Holy Spirit all over you. Yes, you can. You may be listening in Europe or Scotland or Africa, Asia, somewhere in Europe, one of the states in the United States, South America. You can feel the Holy Spirit all over you as you think about your children. But you can feel the Holy Spirit all over you right now because the Holy Spirit is all over you right now. God is ministering to you right now. And God is releasing you from the false accusations the condemnation and the guilt, which Jesus took. He took all that on the cross on your behalf. God sees you as sinless. And God wants you to know that, but God also wants you to know that he has heard every single prayer, the crying out at night for as you've interceded in prayer for your sons and daughters and granddaughters, it may, from the external, exterior position, it may you may look at it from a human perspective, and, and their spiritual situation may appear hopeless to you. It, it, you may think there's no way they're ever going to accept the Lord and return to the Lord. And the Lord wants you to know that you need to pick up your shield of faith, because those thoughts that they'll never be saved, it's too late, etc., are nothing more than the fiery missiles of the evil one being fired at you, and you need to hold up the shield of faith to block those fiery missiles from penetrating your heart and bringing about despair. So what is the faith? The faith is that your prayers God has heard, and he knows that you have been continually praying for all your children and grandchildren by name, who have walked away from the Lord or, or are rebelling from the Lord or whatever the case may be, the Lord has heard all your prayers as you've prayed for their salvation, as you've prayed for their needs and protection, as you've prayed for their deliverance. Now, now please hear me. I mean this. I, I, mean this, I mean this very strongly. I feel the power of the Lord. And I don't want, I, the Lord doesn't need my help by me raising my voice to authenticate the power of the Lord. But the Lord is speaking to you with great power right now. You need to hear what he's saying. The Lord is saying to you, by name, he's calling you by name right now. The Lord is saying to you, I have heard all those prayers. And I, the Lord, have answered all those prayers. Wow. Wow. The Lord is telling you that he's heard all those prayers, and he says, I've answered all those prayers. And you may say, well, I haven't seen the results. Well, what does God's word say? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we hold up the shield of faith. We pray in faith for our children, backslidden children, whatever. We may not see the results. It, things may be getting worse, but we need to remember what God says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when we put our faith in the promises of God, and if we put our faith that God answers our prayer, then when we consider the spiritual condition of our children, even if it's bad, That's not what we lock in on. That's not what we focus in on. That's a temporary spiritual condition. And you need to renounce the lies of the devil because the devil's told you, oh, that's their permanent spiritual condition and they're going to go to hell. That's a lie from the devil. You need to reject it and break it 
And you need to stand on the promises of God's word and by faith continue to pray, by faith claim your child for the kingdom of God, pray for their deliverance and their salvation, and then you turn it over to the Lord. You don't stop praying, but you turn it over to the Lord because the Lord the Lord wants you to hear this. I mean, he really does. The Lord is calling you by name, and the Lord is reminding you that he is faithful. He is faithful, and he is going to answer and has answered every single one of your prayers. And so your job is not to evaluate based on whatever their current rebellion or behavior is, is, is saying. Okay? Even if their current rebellious and, and antichrist type behavior has been going on for 40 years, your job is not to evaluate it. God, God's power, God's deliverance is not constrained by years, days, months, or weeks. God is beyond time, okay? We get uptight because we're mortal human beings. You don't, you don't evaluate the faithfulness of God and his power to answer your prayers based on how many years they've been in rebellion and in a sinful lifestyle. That, that's not how you make your evaluation. You know why? Because the length of time has nothing to do with anything. I'm going to say that again. The length of time that has transpired has nothing to do with anything. It is not an accurate indicator of the outcome. The only accurate indicator of the outcome is that God says that if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, both you and your household will be saved. And if you claim your child for the kingdom of heaven, you may not even be alive when they repent and turn to God. And many times I believe that, tragically, when people die at younger ages or whatever, you, you have no idea what they're saying to God, even if they can't talk when they're lying in the hospital bed or the emergency room or whatever, or in those last closing minutes of their life. You have no idea what's going on. Believe me, the Lord is talking to them, and the Lord is reaching out. And I believe that hundreds of millions of people have received Christ based on their parents' prayers um, when it appeared way past the time, in those closing moments of intimacy between them and the Lord in a hospital at the scene of an accident or whatever. Oh, you'd be surprised. God God is there. I've been in rooms where people were dying and going out. I know the Lord was talking to them. I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room. And I've seen deathbed repentances. So, the Lord wants you to turn your emotions around according to his word and remember that he is faithful. He'll carry the burden. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. Now release it to the Lord and keep praying. And as an act of obedience, whether you feel like it or not, cease and desist from beating yourself up, accusing yourself, because that's counterproductive to what God wants to do. All right. I, th- I believe God ministered to people. I believe that. I believe that message there Many people need to hear. They need to be set free of it. Now, I thank God that we are reaching people all across the United States, all across the world, and we're reaching them 24-7. Not a day goes by that I don't get some email or text or social media comment or the most surprising things. You know, the, the radio program... Uh, starts automatically playing on my cell phone, the Paul McGuire report, and then I'll read the comments below the program, and they're coming in from all over the world. And sometimes they're coming in 10, 15 minutes uh, after the program started. And and I can't tell you how many people have said that they that they were ministered to or set free by the program, or that they... They came to Jesus Christ. They received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior after listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I can't tell you how many people I get messages from that said they were backslidden. They, they had rebelled. They had walked away from God. And for some reason, 
somebody sent them my program, the Paul McGuire Report, and they started listening, and they repented, and they, they, they recommitted their life to Jesus Christ. Many people are motivated to occupy the land until he comes, so I thank God for that. And this is all miraculous, by the way. There's no way that this is happening because Paul McGuire is clever. There's no way it's happening because Paul McGuire is articulate. Okay, that's not that's not the reason. It's God, period. Now, we're able to do this because, thankfully, I have partners like you who are intercessory prayer partners. You have chosen to be prayer warriors and pray for me, this ministry, and my family. I know that I know that I know that your prayers are what allows God to protect us, to anoint us, and and your prayers release the Holy Spirit on these programs and the outreach of this ministry. And that's why people are getting saved and delivered and, and repenting of backsliding. And that's why we are under supernatural protection and able to do it, because you, you have been a faithful prayer warrior, and I thank God for you, because without, I'm telling you flat out, without your prayers, nothing would be happening with this ministry. So I thank God for everyone who's chosen to partner with us by being a prayer warrior. And if God is calling you to be a prayer warrior, your job is to accept your assignment and be a prayer warrior for this ministry. I thank God for those of you that have these talents and abilities where you have helped, often secretly, but you've helped uh, uh, get this show <clears throat> to do end runs around censors, to, to get this show exposed uh, and listened to by people in different social media. You've used your gifting and talents because most of you realize by now that there's a war uh, by the tech giants, social media, the internet, and the mainstream media to shut down uh, strong biblical truth from being communicated. And they're using very dirty tricks, algorithms, bots, all ways of censoring, rigging the internet. So, you know, we, we, we our voice... And, and what the Lord wants to say will be min- minimized and marginalized by their censorship. And that's exactly what it is. It's high-tech censorship. But those of you that have used your talents and abilities to invisibly help us, I'm, I'm thanking you, but I'm saying we need you to keep, to, to keep it up. I asked the other day that uh, this the program of that day be sent to a particular person because many of you know people, whether they're famous or just ordinary people, but that they, you know, that they, that you know, in the depth of your heart, that they need to hear a particular program. Well, guess what? Unless somebody like you is faithful to send it to them and to use your wisdom to make sure they actually hear it and it actually gets placed before their eyes and motivated to listen to it, it's not going to happen because you're, you are the instrument that God uses. So I thank you for that. And then I thank you for uh, those of you who understand that a ministry like this, our ability to continue ministering, our ability to expand our outreach, our ability to upgrade to new television platforms, uh, to upgrade uh, and continue our uh, uh, teaching meetings and where we can, we, there are, broadcast all around the world via the Roku channel, the expansion on new television platforms, the expansion on new social media, and a lot of other stuff that I can't aggressively discuss. All of this happens because people like you choose to think outside of the box. You don't go, you you, you go to the Lord as, you, as we all should, with humility, which means you don't go to the Lord telling him what you're going to do. You'd be surprised of how many Christians go to the Lord with their minds made up about what they're going to do, and then they, they go to the Lord pre- pretending to ask the Lord what to do, but if you've already made your mind up what you're going to do, 
And if you've already arrived your, at your decision about what you're going to do and you're locked into it, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm just saying this, we all need to hear it. Then, then you're really not asking the Lord to tell you what to do if you've already made up your mind what you're going to do. So I want to thank God for each and every one of you that have gone to the Lord asking him to tell you what to do in terms of how you can uh, enable us to keep this ministry reaching people for Jesus. And you've gone to the Lord in prayer, and you haven't made up your mind. You are going to the Lord and seeking his face, and you're asking the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, um, how do you want me to donate or make a financial contribution? And then you ask the Lord, how much do you want me to give? And whatever the Lord tells you to do, whether it's a small amount, on a regular basis, being faithful, we we praise God for that. Whether it's a large amount, we praise God for that. And some of you, God has blessed in special, powerful ways. And that alone is not the basis of your decision. God has blessed you in very special, powerful ways. But, But the bottom line is you need to hear what the Lord is telling you to do. And if the Lord is giving you an amount... Um, whatever the amount is, very large, large, small, regular, whatever it is. The key thing is, no matter what your wealth status, you you may be worth millions. But I'm not going to tell you to give because I'm manipulating you. You need to hear God tell you to give. And if God tells you to give big, give big. If God doesn't, don't. I mean, do what the Lord tells you to do. And I'm trying to say this in a teaching way, because that's how I try to, I try to live my, my Christian life. You see, the, the blessing and the reward of the Lord is never based on works. Now, I could tell you it's based on works, but that would be manipulating you, and I'm not going to do that. The blessing of the Lord comes from faith and grace But the Lord says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And that means that the Lord is looking for you when you come to him and say, Lord, how can I help this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, financially with my donations and contributions? What what do you want me to do, Lord? And then you stop thinking your thoughts and you wait on the Lord doesn't mean you have to stand in one position. You can wait on the Lord while you're carrying out your day. You're waiting on the Lord and you're asking him. And then when the Lord tells you how much to give or what to give, you obey him. Okay? But the blessing comes not from the amount. The blessing comes from the obedience. See, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so, I want you to be blessed, because you are a blessing to this ministry. And so, I, as a servant of the Lord, am accountable to the Lord. God forbid that I should use the Word of God to manipulate you. No, I need to use the Word of God to set you free. And the truth of the matter is, Obedience is better than sacrifice. So what the Lord is looking for is somebody who's going to hear whatever the Lord tells them to do, and that person is going to obey the Lord. That's the person that gets blessed. You see, you could give massive amounts or small amounts, but if you're not doing it based on what the Lord is telling you to do, you won't receive the blessing. The blessing is related to your obedience. And I hope that sets you free. Because together, we can change this world, and together we are changing this world. And we are upgrading, right now we're upgrading our uh, television capacities, and we're going to launch very soon. Because sooner, immediately, because of the critical nature of what's happening in our society and world right now. It's imperative that we reach as many people as we can. And I, so I thank God for all of you. You can visit, I encourage you to visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us, the website. 
You can watch, obviously, for free uh, all of our YouTubes. You can go to our Roku channel. Almost all the new computers, all the new TVs coming out have a Roku channel built into them. If you don't have a TV with a Roku channel built into it, a Roku channel box costs like 20 bucks or something. And, and it, it's so easy to hook up and use. And our Roku channel is called Paul McGuire Ministries. But not only can you get Paul McGuire Ministries, but that Roku channel will open you up to be able to hear and watch all kinds of ministries and a lot better programming that's on, you know, satellite TV and whatever. So if you go to paulmcguire.us, you can go to our Roku channel. You'll see broadcast quality, high definition, mess, uh, prophecy, Bible messages that I've given at conferences, messages that I gave in Paris, France, messages uh, just from all over the place, and the messages that I give uh, at Paradise Mountain Church, which are uh, powerful uh, teachings and Bible prophecy, uh, explanations of current events based on the Word of God, and then there's ministry in the teaching and ministry, and the Spirit of God moves powerfully in these programs, and you can be blessed by these programs. Uh, a lot of you have said, I want to come to your church, Paul, on a regular basis, but I live too far away. Well, that's why we have, uh, we're recording all the uh, Paradise Mountain uh, meetings in broadcast quality HD TV, professionally Hollywood recorded, uh, for you to enjoy the teaching and the ministry teaching. And I promise you, you'll be blessed and uh you can watch it in increments, or you can watch it for three hours. But this isn't boring stuff, okay? There's no announcements in it. You won't be bored, I promise you. Your mind will be renewed. You'll be edified, healed, delivered, and if you're not saved, you'll be saved. So visit paulmcguire.us. Check out the Roku channel. Also coming up Thursday, October 25th, is our next Paradise Mountain uh, church meeting at the Sportsman's Lodge. 6 p.m. sharp in Studio City. I have a powerful message. Uh, I've been seeking the Lord. This message, I believe, will change many people's lives. It'll give you hope, but it'll also give you answers about what's going on. And um, I make myself available to pray personally for anybody who comes there. So ask the Lord, do you need to go to that meeting? And, And I would say the same thing. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, if he tells you to go, obey him. End of story. And ask the Lord, I'm I'm, I'm kind of exhorting you to do this, ask the Lord, do you need to bring someone? And only if the Lord brings a person or persons on your mind, then offer to meet them somewhere and drive them the rest of the way or something and, and grab something to eat before the meeting or whatever. Because look, we especially in California, this is this is a busy age, and and many people don't go to where God wants them to go because, you know, people don't like to drive. They don't want to have to figure out how to get there. Maybe they've never been in that area, and so so the enemy will do anything he can to to keep people away. But if you will take it upon yourself as a ministry, assuming the Lord put them on your heart, then drive them or, or make some kind of arrangement. Then they don't feel, you know, uh, like they're walking in someplace alone, you know. And, and But the thing I want to add, the most important thing is, ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to bring anyone? And only if the Lord, and by the way, the Lord will almost always put people in your mind, put people in your heart, almost always. But if the Lord puts someone or someones on your heart, Bring them, even if you have to drive them or meet halfway. But on the other hand, if a person or persons come to your mind and you have a check in your spirit about them, or you have, you you, you know, you think, well, gee, this would be good for them to come, and you're thinking of some people. But if you don't sense the Holy Spirit green lighting 
your decision. If you don't sense the Holy Spirit saying, yes, you know, I want you to do that. I want you to make sure these people come to the meeting. Then please obey the Lord. We don't want to bring people um, that the Lord is telling you not to bring for obvious reasons. But we do if the Lord tells you to bring because it's not about numbers. It's about who the Lord is calling and obeying the Lord. And and most of you uh, know how to do that. Now, also, we have people regularly fly in from all across the country to these meetings. And I would say to you, and the purpose, again, is not manipulation. The purpose is seek the Lord. If God is calling you to come and you have to fly or drive a long distance, then obey him. But again, make sure that's what God's calling you to do. And you'll know if God's calling you to do it. Obey him. And if he doesn't call you to drive a long distance or fly in, then, then, then don't do it. Don't do it just because it sounds like a good idea. Do it because God's calling you to do it. Okay? That's, that's the key thing. So visit paulmcguire.us, and I'd love to meet you personally there. Okay, we're going to get into stuff that will set you free. And um, I talked about the external environment and um, what, how, what we are in life in so many ways is based on the sensory inputs that we receive even in the womb. Now, let's fast forward because I want to revisit some important topics. One has to do with Kanye West. One has to do with Roseanne Barr, who's been in the news lately. And one will have to do with uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, who uh, uh, alleged that uh, the Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh had uh, uh, sexually assaulted her. Okay, now, uh, as I've told you before, uh, as somebody who's been a professor of Bible prophecy and eschatology at a major Christian university and seminary. Uh, I've taught for decades, and I've taught on that subject, but I also taught uh, at this particular seminary and university on emotional healing from the Bible. And so I have prayed for countless numbers of men and women taught on the subject and People come up to me and confide in me because um, I I will I won't believe anything, but I will accept them. I will believe them, and a lot of people are reluctant because nobody's believed them or they've mocked them or said you're lying or whatever. And I've heard extremely strange stories, and there is of all the large numbers of people that have come to me for counseling and prayer when I teach on this, uh, I can only think of a few where I, my spirit was not bearing witness and uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the discernment of the Holy Spirit said something is not right with what they're telling you. But that, that, that's a very minuscule amount. Most of the time, people are damaged, hurt, and wounded because they uh, attempted to share their abuse or traumatization or whatever, and they've been mocked at, laughed, rejected, and most often told that they were imagining it going way back to childhood. So I'm saying that to say that, um, for the most part, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to believe people because that's usually... Uh, the overwhelming percentages are, are saying something valid. And I would say that about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. But there are, there's a lot of information about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford which was completely censored from the mainstream media on purpose uh, and continues to be hidden from the mainstream media uh, it was they totally blacked it out. They totally censored it during the hearings. They didn't want you to know the truth of her background, and the truth of her background is extremely relevant to to um, what she alleges happened to her. Okay, this is not some peripheral information, and I, I want to recap some things about her background. And I've tried to give this a very sober analysis, 
I, I have not embraced all the information on the internet because I did considerable research and there are a number of uh, things being said about her that are exaggerations or that cannot be proven or that are assumptions or, or lack uh, a definitive proof, okay? So I, so I have to reject those, all right? For the sake of intellectual honesty, I have to reject stuff that doesn't appear to have evidence to confirm it regarding Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. But having said that, there's such an overwhelming amount of information that I came across that's not somebody's opinion, it's not somebody's conjecture, it's not somebody's interpretation. For example, I read a number of her scientific, psychological, and medical research reports because she has, has uh, authored a huge amount of scientific, medical, psychological research reports. She's widely published, and uh, most often she writes these reports uh, along with a team of highly trained psychiatrists, neuroscientists, medical doctors, psychologists, etc., etc., etc. And the thing I want to bring up again is this. First of all, um, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford has family members that work for, that have worked for the CIA, or uh, very likely may currently work for the CIA, and that's difficult to prove, okay? Because sometimes the CIA has front organizations or companies. So I, I try to avoid of making a declarative statement if I can't prove it for sure. But I can say this, there's so many um, uh, coincidences regarding uh, the CIA and, and certain research projects, etc., that, that a very strong question has to be raised to what degree, if any, but to what degree has there been involvement on her part with certain CIA um, uh, research programs? Now, I won't come to the place of making uh, a total judgment call because I believe there's there needs to be more evidence, but there's enough evidence to raise some serious questions. And there is members of the family, uh, close members of the family, that are um, um, connected with the CIA or companies that were owned or controlled by the CIA. And her, her area of specialization, um, I want to review with you again, because her area of specialization is, you know, to not tell people what her area of specialization is, is uh, to, to completely lie, to hide absolutely uh, important truths, okay? And what I'm talking about is that I've read a number of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's uh, research papers that she has written in uh, collaboration with Stanford uh, Medical School, Stanford University, uh, University Palo Alto, uh, and other schools. And, you know, she is a specialist in uh, conducting workshops and doing research in uh, the entire uh, scientific area of what we would call uh, hypnotic therapy, um, where uh, the method, the, the scientific methodology of um, processing people through healing. She's specifically an expert in um, processing people through healing who have underwent traumas. Now, why that is important is because 
her whole testimony rests on the fact that she went through a highly traumatic experience, and that's why she can't remember a lot of pertinent details. And she couldn't even remember the main detail, which was, which was that it was alleged that Kavanaugh uh, molested her or whatever. She couldn't even remember that up until, you know, uh, I think it was 2012. And why was she able to remember it when prior to that she couldn't remember it? Well, um, she goes to a therapist, she takes notes, but she just happens to be an expert and a highly published expert with the most impressive institutions of psychology, psychiatry, neuroscience, and medicine in the nation. So she's an expert in trauma. She's an expert in the retrieval of suppressed memories and many, many other things. Okay, so this is what I want to review for you because this is, this is, this is, abs- to not say this is to be disingenuous and dishonest, which the media has been. The media has functioned as an Orwellian propaganda tool because they've hid this from the American public and it's essential to know. Okay, so, um, there was a professor, Margot Cleveland, who, who, she was the one who first broke the truth about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, um, um, right before the hearings or at the beginning of the hearings, something like that. And, and so Professor Margot Cleveland, um, actually put out on a tweet um, the scientific reports and uh, exactly what uh, Dr. C- one of the projects that Dr. Christine Blasey Ford w- was uh, working on in 2008. And the name of this report, which has Dr. Christine Blasey's name on it, was called Meditation with Yoga, Group Therapy with Hypnosis, and psychoeducation for a long-term depressed mood. A randomized pilot trial headed up by Dr. Lisa D. Butler of the Stanford University School of Medicine and among other authors, Christine Blasey, also of the Stanford University School of Medicine. Her and other researchers published a report in 2008. Now, um, in this research report, as well as many of her other research reports, she um, uses uh, a technology uh, called the self-hypnotic technique. And in her study, she advocates using, quote, hypnosis to retrieve important memories and to create artificial situations. Now pay attention to those words. They're very revealing. The other thing is she advocates the use of hypnosis to, quote, for the retrieval of important memories. Now, if you have to use um, hypnosis for the retrieval of important memories, and if you have to use hypnosis hypnosis uh, to, to uncover memories that the mind has suppressed or buried, which is exactly what happened to her. I mean, it's very strange that what she claims happened to her, she also happens to be an expert in and someone who conducts therapy herself. So this is, this is, there's a dishonesty here that, that's glaring. Okay, now, uh, many of these uh, alternative media things says that she's involved in CIA mind control programs, including MKUltra. Okay, that, on the basis of the evidence we have, uh, that is not proven, but there is circumstantial evidence, not conclusive, that implies that it is possible, okay, for a number of reasons, but it's not conclusive. Now remember, the basis of all scientific mind control, beginning in the 1920s, 
is based on the formula of pain, drugs, and hypnosis. And scientific mind control uh, often goes by the pseudonym uh, trauma-based mind control. I'm going to repeat that word again. Sci modern scientific mind control uh, often goes by another name. It's called trauma-based mind control, where the mind controller uses traumatic, uh, traumatic events in a person's life. Traumatic events that just happened to happen or traumatic events that were uh, specifically created to produce severe psychological trauma in a person's life. Trauma also fits into the basic formula of scientific mind control, which is pain, drugs, and hypnosis. So trauma would fit into the category of pain, great psychological pain, great stress. Now, why is that? Because scientists like Dr. Aldous Huxley and others learned early on in the 1920s that the way the mind works is that when a person experiences severe psychological pain or uh, uh, trauma or severe physical pain or severe stress through any number of things and usually through some kind of traumatic event that they went through or may have been intentionally uh, they may have been intentionally traumatized, as the MK Ultra uh, uh, patients, the Nazi mind control doctors working for Adolf Hitler, deliberately inflicted uh, on their victims uh, severe psychological pain, severe physical pain, and severe trauma. They deliberately inflicted that upon them because psychological pain, physical pain, and trauma all create a open door for the beginning stages of a hypnotic state. In other words, the pain, the shock, the stress is so intense that the way the brain deals with it or compensates for it is the brain puts itself in what's called cognitive dissonance or a disassociative state. Now, let me explain in a moment what a disassociative state is and what cognitive dissonance is, and you'll, you'll understand what we're trying to uh, Expose here with Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This program is essential to set somebody free, and it's you that can be the person who helps to facilitate that. Ask the Lord what you should do, and you can go to paulmcguire.us and send a link of this program to the people who need to hear it. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. By the way, if you want to know if you or somebody you know has been the victim of scientific mind control or trauma-based mind control or has been put into uh, some kind of mild hypnotic state without you even realizing it or if you've been programmed without even realizing it, you really, you really should know about it. You should know about it so you can be set free from it. And that's why I wrote the book, Conquering the Matrix. It will tell you whether or not you're under mind control or uh, have been subjected to uh, hypnotic programming and, and many other things. It will also teach you how you can be set free from it, how you can be deprogrammed from this. There are a lot of people walking around, a lot who have been um, victimized through various experiences, some intentional, and are under various forms of mind control, which produces very, very destructive results in their life, and nobody around them can figure why so many bad things keep happening. Well, it could be that there has been mind control involved. 
So you needed to know how to overcome it and defeat it. Get yourself a copy of Conquering the Matrix. And if you want to know how it works with, like, the music industry, Illuminati videos, etc., then get yourself a copy of A Prophecy of the Future of America. And if you want to know how it works on a mass level, mass mind control, get a copy of Mass Awakening. All are available at a discount at paulmcguire.us. Okay, let's talk about a traumatic event, uh, a psychologically painful event. This is the, the Nazi doctors uh, perfected MK Ultra mind control. That's a fact. And MK Ultra mind control was based on the formula of pain, drugs, and hypnosis. So they subjected the patients they were put in put, that, that they were going to put into a mind control state. They began with exposing them to overwhelming psychological pain or physical pain or shock or trauma. And that means they would either do the most horrific, brutalizing, obscene, evil things to these people that I do not want to repeat to you because it's like listening to a depiction of somebody going through hell. They would inflict that on people and young babies. Now, what that does, that overwhelming pain and trauma, what that does is a person could die. They could shut down experiencing that level of pain or trauma. So as a protective mechanism, the mind, when it experiences that kind of level of pain and trauma, go. It, 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 the mind separates itself. It's kind of like this. The pain uh, physically or psychologically or the trauma is so intense that if you kept it in your mind, body, and spirit, you would like disintegrate, die or something, okay? Because it's so intense that you, you can't take it. So what your mind does is kind of like, on a psychological level, split itself in two. So it's like, you enter a state of mind where you, it's like almost an automatic hypnotic thing. Your mind kind of like on an automatic hypnotic thing separates itself from itself or disassociates itself from itself. And so there is a, a artificial psychological distance between the you that's being traumatized the you that's going through the psychological pain or physical pain, there's a psychological distance now as you disassociate, enter a disassociative state, you separate yourself psychologically from the self that is experiencing the trauma and the pain. That's a protective mechanism. That is also called cognitive dissonance. That means your thoughts that you're experiencing and processing while you're going through incredible trauma, incredible psychological or physical pain, would cause you to just crack. But your mind goes into like an auto-hypnotic state. You separate yourself from yourself, creating a psychological distance, and that's called cognitive dissonance. That separation of your thoughts and dissonance means... There's like a there's like a giant space between the you that's experiencing the torture, the horror, the brutality, the trauma, and the psychological pain, and there's another part of you which is kind of like observing it in the distance. This happens to uh, people who are in war. Uh, this is one of the things that happens to people who get PSTD and are involved in the atrocities of, of warfare. They can experience or go through something that is so horrific in the battlefield. And what happens is, I mean, they may see their friend right in front of them blow themselves to bits. That's such shock. That's such horror. That's such trauma. Or they see their legs blown off and their friends just, you know, blown into pieces or whatever. That is such intense shock, trauma, pain. Uh, physical pain, psychological pain, that it's overwhelming. So what happens to the soldier 
that has PSDD is that they their brain automatically separates themselves and, and, and like looks upon these horrific events as like they were looking upon it from a distance or it, they're looking upon it as if it happened to somebody else, not them. And this is the brain's way of cushioning the impact. It's a protective mechanism, okay? Now, the problem is, is that although it's the brain's way of a protective mechanism, it's kind of like an automatic form of hypnosis. Through therapy, through prayer, through processing this, a person can go through a traumatic experience, psychological pain, physical pain, and through therapy and certain procedures and uh, certain kinds of medication or whatever, a person can be, they can be reintegrated. They have to process through the pain. They have to work it through because if it's not worked through, they're going to live in a state of psychological separation between themselves. That's because they, they've never processed the pain. They've never been able to make to to to, to work it through. It just it, the shock stays in their system. And that's why people will have PSTD. Now, but what happens when you are a targeted victim of scientific mind control, they will use that pain and trauma. And they will amplify it. Or if you're being programmed in a secret laboratory or a secret facility on purpose, they will deliberately inflict psychological pain, physical pain, and trauma on you. Okay? And then they will accelerate it. They will multiply it by a thousand times. So the pain, the trauma, the horror, uh, the psychological pain, whatever it is, it's now going to go through a force multiplier and it's going to be magnified by about a thousand times. How do they do that? They give you the most powerful mind-altering drug known to man, known as LSD. LSD will take the trauma and the pain and it will multiply it by a thousand times. This is Now, the brain then the brain doesn't know the difference between the hallucinations produced by the LSD and uh, what actually happened. So even if it's a hallucinatory uh, magnifier, the brain perceives it as real. What, what this does, the combination of the original trauma and, and the magnifying it with the powerful drug LSD, what this does is it drives the human mind deliberately to the shattering point or the breaking point. So think of your mind like a like a like a an ice block for the sake of a metaphor. And for the metaphor, think of the ice block as the normal part of your brain. Okay, when you experience a combination of LSD and psychological pain and trauma, the force of that is so powerful, it's like taking your brain as if it was made of, of, of uh, ice and you throw it on the floor with all your might and it shatters into a bunch of pieces. The human mind and psyche cannot take this level of stress and pain and shock and trauma. So what happens is the person's personality uh, breaks off into different comp compartments. You've heard the term compartmentalize. That's just a fancy word for saying that people deal with pain in their lives by compartmentalizing. On the exterior of their life, you know, they're the life of the party, they're laughing, uh, they make jokes all the time, and, uh, you know, they drink, and they're, everybody thinks they're jovial, happy people, okay? Well, that's because they have... They have compartmentalized. They have their happy part that they show to the public, but deep inside they buried their suicidal, depressed part, which is very unhappy. But but they have done that in an attempt to keep it all together. 
eventually it all unwinds. But that's the, the, the internal psychological strategy. So the mind control people deliberately drive people to a shattering point. When they have shattered your mind and broken your mind or cracked your mind, then they can put it together again or recreate it again or remold it, change your identity, change your thoughts. In other words, it's like shattering anything, a vase or something. You shatter it and you could glue it together and and make it take the shape of a completely different form. That's what mind control does. You can make a Manchurian candidate, an assassin, a beta sex slave, or all any kinds of things. So what you do is you glue this mind back together temporarily through mind control. And you do it subconsciously because all programming happens on the subconscious level using hypnotic therapies. That's why it's pain, drugs, and hypnosis. Once you've shattered the mind, you use a variety of hypnotic therapies to reprogram and give a person a new identity, new likes and dislikes, a new belief system, and you can also embed secret commands. And, and you, you keep this all in the subconscious. So the, per, the person that has underwent this doesn't even know what they, what they went through. Okay? So this is the, the dynamic which occurs. And that's how they make uh, Manchurian candidates. And that essentially, by the way, is what is called MK Ultra mind control. Now, you can take MK, MK Ultra uh, mind control and you can take it up a bunch of levels even to, to even more powerful mechanisms of mind control, like monarch mind control, where you just don't have one subconscious program personality like an assassin or whatever through monarch mind control where the pain and trauma is even greater you shatter the mind and you create multiple personalities so you could have 18 different personalities all created hypnotically and programmed into somebody's subconscious okay and that's that's a powerful thing now okay so what happens in both cases, the person is not consciously aware <clears throat> that they've been through the MK Ultra program programming because part of the hypnotic process is they erase your memory that you were ever programmed. So it's all buried in your subconscious. However, using a trigger word like one, two, three, or it could be any po- poem or whatever, it could be a trigger symbol, a trigger color, a trigger, a trigger song. Uh, a trigger ringtone on a cell phone, anything can function as a hypnotic trigger. The person who has been programmed subconsciously, when they hear the trigger sound or whatever, or word, they, like they're sleepwalking, you know, they're aware, but they're not really aware. And they begin to act out whatever has been programmed into them. So if they've been programmed to be an assassin... They're going to be out to kill somebody, all right? If they've been programmed to be a beta sex slave, they're going to, uh, for the purpose of espionage, the man or the woman will target the, the, the individual because they use the sexuality as a way of spying and influencing a person. All right, so this is uh, MK Ultra Mind Control, which came here in 1947 when the CIA smuggled into the United States under Operation Paperclip, 10,000 Nazi mind control scientists and 10,000 Nazi rocket scientists. And you can read the whole story of this in Conquering the Matrix, A Prophecy of the Future of America, and Mass Awakening. Now, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, what is obvious here? There's no words called mind control in her scientific research reports. But when you read them and use critical thinking, when a person gives their mind over voluntarily to be hypnotized, when a person gives their mind over to retrieve a a deeply suppressed memory through trauma, 
when a person gives themselves over to hypnosis uh, to receive uh, an artificial memory that never really happened. That's exactly what it says. I mean, that's what it says in, in her area of specialization and research. I mean, let's not be naive here, okay? They can create new memories. They say it's for, for therapy, but um, they use hypnosis for the retrieval of important memories, and they use um, uh, um, they, they create new memories, okay, uh, which they term create artificial situations. And see, this is using words that play games. Create artificial situations means they, they are going to hypnotize you and they're going to program you to believe that something happened that didn't happen for whatever purpose. It's an artificial memory put into you by hypnosis. Now, why is this important? It's important because her whole testimony of what happened may be purely the product of a retrieval through hypnosis of a suppressed memory, but that's highly uh, unreliable scientifically. Or it may be that somebody implanted a false memory in her, such as a false memory of being molested by Kavanaugh. Now, obviously, we can't prove that. But let's take a worst-case scenario. So suppose somebody programmed her, or she volunteered to be programmed, given her pedigree, to receive a false memory about being molested by Kavanaugh. Of course her testimony would be believable. Of course she would be convincing, because she believed it really happened. But what they're not revealing is she has the knowledge and expertise to receive an artificial memory. And then the other thing that has to be uh, um, acknowledged is that she um, conducted many scientific research studies, and in these scientific research studies, they say right in the title, they use meditation with yoga, they use group therapy, by the way, has a dark side. Group therapy can be one of the most powerful forms of psychological mind control. Read Dr. Aldous Huxley, who I quote extensively in Mass Awakening. So meditation with yoga, group therapy with hypnosis, and psychoeducation. I think psychoeducation, well, it's implying that you can be psychologically educated, but I think it has nuances that are deeper than that. Psychoeducation for a long-term depressed mood Okay, and it's a randomized pilot trial, which means it's a trial to see how this works. So they're using a variety of hypnotic techniques to uh, create artificial situations or artificial memories or retrieve important suppressed memories. And all of this, by the way, involves trauma because you would only suppress a memory if you were traumatized. So at the very least, we have the core and essential ingredients of scientific mind control in the mix here. On top of that, the institutions that Dr. Christine Blasey Ford worked for, Stanford University, now they claim their experimentation and mind control is over, but from like, I think it was the, the, the 1950s to the 19, late 1960s, uh, Stanford University was the center of mind control experimentation, and MK Ultra experimentation. Now, supposedly that's over and done with. Well, it's strange that, that this, this whole hypnotic memory trauma thing comes out of Stanford uh, University Medical School. There's just eerie coincidences. Now, I want to make a comment about somebody else, Roseanne Barr. Roseanne Barr, obviously, is a celebrity and comedian, she has said repeatedly in public that she has been victimized by MK Ultra mind control. And she has re said repeatedly in public that numerous Hollywood celebrities and music stars, etc., 
have also been victims of MK Ultra mind control. Most of the time, uh, the media laughs at her and says she's crazy and a paranoid nut and a conspiracy theorist. That is an inappropriate response. We, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a member of the mainstream media, and you're gonna lie for a living, <clears throat> and you're gonna tell everybody how sensitive, and and how we need to believe, I believe your truth regarding Dr. Christine Blasey. We need to believe her truth. We must always listen to the victims of abuse and trauma. If you're going to preach that, which is what they preach, then you have that has to be applied equally and fairly to everybody. Everybody should be entitled to be believed. Okay, That would include Roseanne Barr and Kanye West. So when Roseanne Barr says she's been victimized by MK Ultra mind control, that's trauma-based mind control. Why is it uh, permissible to laugh at her, mock at her, and ridicule her, while at the same time dignifying Dr. Christine Blasey Ford? That's in- inconsistent morally. And then you have uh, Kanye West, who I analyzed, and I... Uh, I don't know if this is a, as, a, as a fact. I am um, speculating based on knowledge and research and understanding. And I can't make a definitive conclusion. I mean, Roseanne Barr came out and said she was a victim of MK Ultra mind control. But Kanye West has a biography and a psychological history which I believe the man's a genius, by the way. Uh, But he's being mocked and ridiculed and demeaned by the media, and nobody's believing his truth. But there are a lot of things that have happened to him psychologically and related events in his life, which give me... I can't make a, a definitive conclusion, but there's too many things that have happened in his life that that have the ring of MK Ultra mind control for me not to wonder or speculate not conclude I need I need more evidence before I conclude one way or the other but it causes me to speculate as to whether or not he may have indeed Kanye West been victimized by MK MK Ultra mind control now, I'm not demeaning him as a person because I defended him the other day. I think he's a genius. I really do. I don't think he's crazy. See, a lot of people who have gone through MK Ultra Mind Control, they're dismissed as being crazy and mocked. That's how they shut him up. No, they're, they're saying something. If you look at his life, recent hospitalization, they erased his memory. Erasing people's memory is one of the essential components in MK Ultra mind control. You need to know that. You need to know all about it. That's why you need to read my book, Conquering the Matrix. You need to, to own this truth and A Prophecy of the Future of America and Mass Awakening because I talk about the erasing of memory. Dr. Owen Cameron, who was one of the most prestigious psychologists and psychiatrists in the world. In fact, he was the president and head of the World Psychiatric Association, was secretly an MK Ultra mind control monster in a, 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 in a, in a, a hospital um, where it is alleged that the CIA helped finance this through through front organizations. Dr. Owen Cameron, uh, I believe the hospital was in Canada, uh, starting in the, the, the 50s and the 60s, and who knows how long it went on. He would put many people, people would come to his uh, psychological clinic for treatment of ordinary depression and anxiety and stuff. Once he got them through the door, he inflicted MK Ultra mind control on them, and he would erase their memories. 
He would subject them to the most brutal. I've read the accounts. I have some of the accounts in the book, Conquering the Matrix. He would subject them to the most brutal trauma. He subjected these innocent people to um, the most barbaric psychological pain, physical pain, powerful drugs like LSD, hypnosis, electroshock therapy, and worse. And what he would do with these powerful mind-altering techniques, he, for example, with electroshock therapy, he did not give a basic dose of electroshock that psychiatry is used to bring people out of depression. There are accounts of people witnessing uh, he would put so much voltage. The voltage he would use when he put his patients through electroshock therapy was so intense that, that the patients would be tied from ropes, like hanging from the ceiling, and their bodies would be convulsing violently. Now think of a human body hanging from the ceiling, receiving not just a minor electroshock, but re- receiving who knows how many, how much voltage, but voltage so powerful going through their body, their bodies for such a long period of time that their bodies are convulsing violently because they're being blasted with this intense voltage. Okay, he was literally frying their brain cells, and you see. When you subject somebody to this kind of electroshock, you burn out their brain cells. You 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 are, you are erasing their memory, and that's part of MK Ultra. So what he was deliberately doing is was erasing people's memories, and then he would either put new memories, new programming in them, or he leave them like vegetables. And I'll give you an example: Doctor Owen Cameron. This one woman came in for depression mild depression, by the time he finished treating her through horrific dosages of electroshock therapy, LSD, pain, sexual abuse, all kinds of stuff, by the time he finished with this woman, I I think her therapy lasted like two years or something, two or three years, when he finished with her and, and her husband, she was a mother of two children, I think, two or three children, and she had a husband. When she finally left this mental hospital, he, he had totally erased her memory. He had wiped her memory and personality, erased it all. When she met her husband, she didn't know who her husband was. She didn't know who her children was. She could not remember basic things like how to walk, how to go to the bathroom, how to use the toilet. She could not even remember how to speak. She left as a vegetable. And then, uh, you know, her family was trying to teach her how to go to the bathroom again and how to speak English again and all that. And one day she was sitting in a public library and she was reading through the magazine and she saw a picture, a news article, of this psychiatrist named Dr. Owen Cameron. The minute she saw the guy's face, she broke down sobbing hysterically in the library and a flood of memories that were suppressed came back, and she remembered this psychiatrist who tortured her and erased her memory. And a lawsuit was initiated. They were paid some small sum, all the victims, and now they've returned again, just recently, for a second lawsuit. So mind control is real, and mass mind control is real. The worst thing you could do is to be naive. You know, the Bible says that we're we're not to be ignorant of our enemy's devices. And if you're ignorant of potential dangers and pitfalls, then you are really not wearing the full armor of God. And the purpose of talking about this was not to frighten or scare anyone. It's an unpleasant subject, but to educate you so that you can be set free. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Somebody you know must hear this program, and you're the person that needs to send it to him. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire.